it's been a pleasure spending these three days over here. In fact, I realize uh, after thanking the organizers and uh, Dr. Dhinkar, who sent me the invitation to begin with, and then obviously India Bioscience team and others who are associated with this. It has brought me to a learning curve and added to that learning curve. And that brings me to the first lesson which all of us have in our mind very predominant and that is the learning curve growth does not stop anywhere, it doesn't saturate. And if it saturates that means then we're not contributing to science. So it has definitely been very fruitful time over here these three days and I have learned a lot. Now besides being, uh, besides owning the job of mentorship, I thought probably I was a mentor also. I was getting mentored in, in, during this process. I belong to a category which is a little different from the categories of scientists whom you heard as mentors because I'm homegrown. And obviously, when you start a career, which is, it has a lot of difficulties. It has a lot of uh, stress associated with it because of a variety of reasons, which will come in a minute. And uh, so I belong to that category of, I'm not a prodigy, and nor do I have a very great pedigree. Because in Indian science, when I entered in early 70s, the pedigree requirement was very, it, it still continues to be there, but it was very important. Who's your mentor? And which lab you came from? from, And uh, what is the name associated? So I just put it funnily over here. Famous boss to hold your hand, to promote your future. India, somehow we used to be in that kind of a uh, mental state. So what was important for me if I started my career, research career in India, and I continue to be here, though I went abroad several times afterwards, establishing the credibility became a priority for me. So lesson number two. First was that the curve, which is learning curve, it does never ends, it does, it does not saturate. And second lesson is that it's very important in science to establish the credibility. And you all know what all goes in establishing the credibility and continuing uh, with that. And I did not run away, but I ran against the current and against the dominant voices which prevailed and prevailed till date. Because you have dominant voices which run the show. It's not most of the times the dominant voices may not be the right voices. So what is important to learn here is how to contribute to that dominant voice so that along with it, there is another voice also emerging and then it's heard to some extent. That's how what changes the policies. That's what changes the basic character. So challenge was another, at another level, the challenge was working in a university system. Today, university system is becoming much better with great funding. Earlier in my days, four decades back, the university system did not have infrastructure, did not have adequate money to support research. So four decades back, it was resource and infrastructure, and then you have responsibility of teaching, and your vice chancellor puts on your shoulders other <coughs> added responsibilities of some administration here or there. If you don't get house in the university, then you are made a warden of a hostel, which is another problem to deal with the students. So you have added responsibilities in a university setup. Nevertheless, I think it has normalized over these four decades. It has normalized now. We have a number of new, 16 new universities have been added, which are central universities, which have the same status as JNU, Delhi University, and other central universities. So you have more opportunities to enter these universities. And I'm sure I just came a day before I came over here. For, I had gone for some selections at University of Central University of Kerala, a wonderful place to visit. And we inducted some professors, assured professors, and assistant professors. And I saw one young investigator who had joined last year this program in Kashmir. So he was there. And then when I asked him, who motivated you to come for this interview, then he gave me a name. And then we interviewed him. 
So I have chosen this topic, although I'm going to wrap it along with my research activity and convey that what difficulties one faced, what was those highs and lows and the struggle to make a difference in one's own way, because ultimately it is your own conscience which has to be satisfied. You have your peer group to review you, assess you, but ultimately it comes down to, if you're an honest person, then it comes down to your own conscience. Are you doing the right thing? Are you ethical? So it ultimately, I believe in that Gandhian paradigm. Maybe I'm old enough to believe in that kind of paradigm, but then it's to make a difference, it's ultimately your own conscience and to continue with that. But over the years, research became a passion. Today, I think that 65 years of my age, I should just wrap it up in a capsule and give it to a youngster in my area of research so that he just grapples with it and within, within, within a day or two, knows about everything and starts from there. The career starts from there. Now imagine this 25 year old or 22 year old youngster starts from all that what is known till 2016. The questions are going to be very different. The questions are not going to be those repetitive questions which I addressed and grappled with and moved on. I think mentorship is that. For me, mentorship is becoming a challenge for me for future years because I have refused to continue in JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, because I thought, let me contribute in some different way. And uh, since I have trained 400 trainees in the past 10 years, it's passion with me to train people and to expose them whatever knowledge base I would be equipped with. So it has become a passion, but late in my career because I had to establish credibility first. I don't know whether I have established that or not, I don't know. But it has become a passion. And what's important is, since I did not have great mentors, the time period was like that in India around that time. So how did I learn? I learned by carefully watching people, listening to people. Now this is another lesson. For you all who have done postdoc from Yale to uh, any other institution, Harvard or others, they may not think it's very important, but I feel it's important for them too. Observing, listening carefully, learning, because learning is there from everyone. And then you can filter at your level that what you want to imbibe or you don't want to, you want to throw it away as. And the world outside was obviously a feeder for me, mentoring me, and keenness within, which mentored me over the years. Unfortunately, I did not have mentors. This is my career graph. So I worked on a problem PhD problem prenatal diagnosis. Now this was competitive at that time with the rest of the globe because in late 60s, 68, 69, people started working on prenatal diagnosis that amniotic fluid you take from pregnant woman, you try to do prospective counseling. All the prospective counseling did not come into picture around that time, but came in mid 70s and later. And then you advise this family how to go about their genetically abnormal child. The knowledge base was not that great. Molecular biology was not in picture to be applied to this, which came in early 70s then. So I worked on that competitive area. Now coming from a small place and landing at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, so that you can understand, this is, this is kind of a qualitative jump where you're not exposed and you want to cover that gap of coping up with those who are there parallel to you coping up with the knowledge base which is there. So it's possible. I may be a late bloomer in that sense, but there would be many late bloomers in our country because they don't get that opportunity, that exposure. So it's important. This is another lesson. So besides you who are here, here, over here, uh, sitting out here, I would consider you privileged and very fortunate. So there are others in thousands, not in hundreds, there are who are outside, they don't have this privilege. So probably India Bioscience should also look into this issue that scale has to be probably, it has to be at a different scale in due course of time if it happens. And I would just add another point over here since I was listening to very, very informative and important because information is power and information is through information if you don't have. Most of the people in India do not have information. Most of the students do not have adequate information. So you are again privileged from that point of view. How this information can be, India Bioscience can play a role. 
because there's a gap. There's a gap that there are funding agencies, there are other agencies which are providers, but they are not in sync with institutions who are going to employ you. So there has to be a system created that they become, they are in sync. Now, how do you create this sync with the institutions is another challenge which has to be met. And then expectations will be met over there. So after moving, doing this prenatal diagnosis, very competitive area, and I was not doing, believe me, I did not do sexing of males and females. At that time, I would have earned billions of rupees in India because people were after my life. I was the first one in the country to do this at that point of time. Anyway, to cut the whole story short, I moved as a faculty to Brunson in the university. I taught there for 10 years almost in, uh, for human genetics, medical genetics in a medical uh, school and came to Jawaharlal Nehru University. This has been a very fertile ground. All India Institute has been a very fertile ground for me because that kind of exposure and awareness and we established a society which was called young, Society of Young Scientists, SYS. And believe me, it exists till today. That means 40 years down the line, it has survived. So there must have been good points. And I remember having uh, interviewed six, seven Nobel laureates at that time as a PhD student who came to India, who came to Delhi. And those days, incidentally, there were many international conferences that were held over there. One was on steroids, and was on pediatrics. And John Kenry, who I interviewed, and we had a newsletter where we used to do. Having said all this, meaning thereby there was a qualitative leap for me in order to have an exposure, even if I did not have mentors either from outside or inside the country. Jawaharlal Nehru University has been good ground to transform because in a medical institute, I could not do what I did here. There are limitations in medical institutions once you get into the, the medical institutions, especially in India. Abroad also there are, there are MD, PhD programs which probably cover that limitation to some extent. But we have some limitation in India and we need to handle that at our level, how to solve that problem. And here at BHU, again, the problem I picked up was changing from prenatal to something else. Now, this is another problem in India that whatever area of research you are in, say you came from abroad and you got employed in a university, state or central, somewhere in remote corner. Now you can't establish that kind of thing to begin with. But challenges, this is lesson number, what were, four or fifth. That you, you have to grapple with those issues and you have to see what best can you do within the circumstances. So as a mentor, I would suggest that you don't have to be bogged down by the situations. What we did was very innovative. This is called M3 endoduplicated chromosomes. Now in this, if you do PubMed search today and you say M3 endoduplicated chromosomes, you will see only two publications from us. Now that doesn't mean that it was great work, but it's difficult. It's difficult to attempt it. Fortunately, we had the situation in Bloom syndrome, uh, so we worked it out over there. What, why is it important? It was important because you can score for somatic recombinations, which can't be done at chromosome level, even till date. You can't do a somatic recombination counting and then say what has happened. If I had support at that time, in late 70s, early 80s, I could have looked for it's not relevant today, but at that time, I could have looked for loss of heterozygosities, looked into cancer situations, shown it physically, it's happening at these M3 endoduplicated chromosome level. It would have been very good in piece of information. It went back and forth at that time in nature, nature genetics, PNAs, then I shelved it. So this is what happens in our situation over here, and you have to grapple with it. It doesn't stop you from moving ahead. That's another lesson which I learned. Where I saw these chromosomes, I established this because it's very hard to interpret what it could be. So anyway, came, coming to the conclusion, this was from a Bloom syndrome and we identified in India, first Bloom syndrome case. And this Bloom syndrome has one of the key features is, of course, cystochromatic exchanges. That is the characteristic feature by which you can diagnose this patient. And uh, the Indian patient was diagnosed because a PhD student of mine was watching a movie along with a doctor from another medical institution and they were talking about that we have a case in dermatology 
which cannot be identified but seems to be bloom, but nobody is there to diagnose. So this student comes back to me and we have been discussing about bloom and I have been telling them about stories to bloom, probably telling my woos that I could not continue with N300 chromosome. So comes back and tells me that, sir, there is something which is there and needs to be identified. So that's how we established. James German used to ask me, why is it in one billion population you do not have a Bloom syndrome case? It turns out to be, and we have identified second one also. I did not find BLM mutation in this, which was established over a period of, period of time. We were also trying to map uh, in the genome that what are the genes which are responsible for this. I was doing it through somatic cell hybridization methodology, looking into it. It turned out that pyruvate kinase for me, which was on 15 number chromosome, where BLM gene also has been identified, which is responsible now, is known for Bloom syndrome etiology. But 7% of Blooms do not have BLM mutation. Now that's the catch. And BLM does not explain all kinds of clinical features, which is like non-insulin dependent diabetes, proneness to infections. It does not explain that. So I had this, can once I found the PKM and one of the isozymic forms of PKM, which is PKM2, is implicated in it, I immediately jumped because we looked into all those days. We did it through molecular dynamics studies that uh, what can happen to these mutants. The enzyme activity was compromised very differentially. Why it was differentially was another question. So we wanted to look into all these aspects. Again, uh, as I have written here, after three months of review, it was because they asked me the question, what is the relation now that Bloom is known, BLM is known, what is the relationship of PKM2 with BLM gene? I told them that there, there may be no relationship because 7% of Bloom do not have Bloom involvement. So how do you take that? Now acceptability of this particular gene is coming into picture. Reason being that of, this was paper sent in 90s. And in 2005 and 6, PKM2 becomes suddenly very important because of two nature papers saying that it's important in cancer metabolism. So we had seen and we had obviously proposed that this is involved for cancer in Bloom syndrome situation. The gene is here and the abnormal gene is there, homologous pairs of chromosomes. The pos because it's a homotetramer enzyme, there are these five possibilities which can happen for the homotetramer to take shape. So we were asking this question, does it really happen? And experimentally by this co-expressions, you can see a particular technique does not work so well of cross-linking. We evolve another technique and you can score for this one, two, three, four, five. And along with it, you get a dimer. Now story starts from here. So you see dimer and to cut the whole story short, we saw this dimer in tumor tissues. We saw this dimer every time I was transforming cells in vitro. So there was this dimer connectivity emerging. And this dimer happens to be inactive, enzymatically. It does not. Tetramer is the active form. And you have these five forms emerging there too, which we had theoretically supposed that if this is a tetramer, there are these five possibilities which can emerge over there. But then does it answer the question? No, it does not answer the question of its role in cancer. And this answers the question. <coughs> So again, because this will be an allele, which will be normal, there will be abnormal one, the bad one, and this is a tetramer, and you have all these possibilities emerging from that, then these heterooligomers have higher chances of creating soft acre colonies, increases the cell cycle, this rate, and creates a nude mouse tumor too. Now this was beyond doubt established that how this metabolic enzyme in the glycolytic pathway when it is inactivated, it remains as a stable dimer and the stable dimer pushes, pushes the cycle towards the PPP shunt, producing all what is required by the cancer cell because it's proliferating. And normal, normally what happens, there's a dynamic shift, maybe due to FBP because it's an allosteric enzyme turning it to a tetramer and back to dimer when its cell division is required. That's probably what I think that happens in, in, in fetus or embryo, a dynamic relationship. But I still feel that there has to be some factor which binds to this and stabilizes it. We have not found out that as yet. Bloom syndrome, I said type 2 diabetes. So we wanted to understand how does insulin regulate this. So insulin through, again to cut the whole story short, through this pathway, which is the experiments where 
silencing for these genes has been done. Even pharmacologically inhibitors have been used. So both the approaches have been used and seen that through this pathway, PKM2 expression is increasing and activity is decreasing through ROS. And this explains the phenomenology of cancer induction. So it turned out, and to cut again the whole story short, in tumors, you find this dimer form of PKM2, inactive form of PKM2, it gets phosphorylated also at a particular position, tyrosine 105, and inactivates it, but it remains as a stable dimer. That's an important observation which I showed you experimentally also when we were doing experiments with this. It turns out, because we have to answer two questions, that in a tumor you will have situation where you will have this proliferation, rate of proliferation, which could be explained through this tuner, which is a metabolic tuner, which is tuning it towards the proliferation rate. But at the same time, there are cells within the tumor which are not vascularized so well, or because of the proliferation rate, they undergo a condition which is hypoglycemic kind of a condition. So under such situation, what would happen? Anyway, we are pushing this story where we have seen that through LK, LKB, AMPK pathway, how it is happening, the whole mechanism. So we obviously have difficulties with this because it's not an established thought. So we have seen that how it can happen with these two isosomic forms that a balance is maintained in these tumors and there can be a survival state and there can be a proliferative state and this balance shifts between these two states depending on the situation of availability of glucose in the milieu. And finally, we have tried to see that how pyruvate kinase, because in Bloom syndrome, all these things happen. Infertility happens, instability happens, early aging, diabetes, hypersensitivity. We are trying to see that all these effects, how it could be explained through this, in one of our re two recent reviews, we have named it as that as a tuner, metabolic tuner. And once certain events take place, these events are upstream events. Uh, through signal transduction, kinase is being involved, but they get converged. Now for this question of convergence at a metabolic tuner level, was the question, does it really happen in tumors? So I'm just going to give a quick story on, so what happens, we picked up sporadic breast cancer because sporadic breast cancer, we have been simultaneously working on that. We do not know the gene till date. We know here BRCA1, BRCA2, BRCA12 involved over here in familial cases, 10%, but 90% of the cases do not have those genes in, implicated. So we wanted to know what's happening. Does it get converged in the background of variety of changes, mutations, which happen in uh, the breast cancer? Does it get converged over there? We try to map also through loss of heterozygosity, genome wide. We try to look, out, look at some informative positions, markers, which can give us a handle on some new genes or new tumor suppressor genes. We found that there was one, again, it's a new microRNA, which is behaving in a tumor suppressor manner. It was there out of 400 sporadic breast cancer cases, 20% showed that this kind of instability happens in that particular region, and it codes for microRNA over there, which behaves in a, as a tumor suppressor gene. Incidentally, this microRNA targets pyruvate kinase M2. So again, the loop started you know, building up that it's targeting PKM2, it's regulating PKM2. That means you have an epigenetic regulation at this level for PKM2 happening there in these cells. We tried to look into a logical path, which is called hypothesis dependent approach of looking into apoptotic gene failures, DDR response, DNA damage response failure, if it happens, or cytokine surveillance failure, because you know about it, that is it, no knowledge. So one would like to see the crosstalk of all these and the, the network of these genes, what is happening? It turned out that in the genetic backgrounds for all this, now genetic background is not easy to look into all these networking working genes in DDR apoptotic immune surveillance pathways. You're looking into specific variations which are functionally relevant. So you're studying promoter variations over there. You're establishing them through in-reporter assays, you know, in vitro, and then establishing. You're also seeing in real time in cancer situation in tissue, does it really match with that in vitro expression? All that has been done. And then these have been established and you can see what all, I can't go into the details. The genotype status of all these genes which are involved in apoptosis, which prevent so we found this, we found this at epigenetic level, and it turned out that there is hypermethylation of 
apoptotic genes and there is hypomethylation of anti-apoptotic genes. That means there is a pro-survival signal which is coming out and this pro-survival signal again gets converged at metabolic level at the spiroid kinase level. You can see this dimer is much more the tissues, the expression, this is from tumor tissues, expression in tumor of PKM2 is high in both the stages and the dimerization which is which I mentioned earlier also happens. So there is a convergence for this PKM2 to tune the cell towards a metabolic state. I will quickly because I have five minutes, I just quickly go into a story which is interesting and one asks a question, there is so much of genotype backgrounds which are prevalent over there. Well, I am interested in a convergent story towards a metabolic tuning of a cell because therapeutically it becomes very easy for me to target at that tuner rather than many things in the kinase and other levels. Okay, So in that situation, I wanted to ask because we were doing this hypothesis independent approach in whole genome of mitochondria too and the crosstalk between mitochondria and the nucleus. So quickly I would say we found out a germline change in ND3 which is the complex 1, 46 proteins coming together, ND3 is one of the subunits which is NADH. So we looked into the mutation quickly, you can see this is mute, this is changed, this is G to A change which is happening and A is more prevalent in cases both in breast cancer as well as esophageal cancer. So we asked a question why is it so? It had to be established. So mechanistically we generated this mic mito vector because normally cybrid studies are done in such situations. But we didn't want to do cybrid studies, it has limitations so we did in, we synthesized ND3, this long gene, we expressed it in the mitochondria and <coughs> ROS is high. Now you, I have to go quick so I will just explain ROS was high. You can see carbonylation high under that situation. You can also see because of this ROS, the glucose uptake and the lactate production which is Warburg's hypothesis is being followed just by one change in the mitochondrial one of the subunits. It epigenetically, these are all CPG sites in different apoptotic and anti-apoptotic and DDR genes. You can look at this, this is real time expression of these genes and the ratio, anti-apoptotic is high. What you saw in tumor situations earlier that there is survival pathway being favored. You can see anti-apoptotic pathway is being favored when this one base change in mitochondria takes place and through ROS it regulates the nuclear setup in such a manner that it makes the cell pro-cancerous. And the pro-cancerous state can be established by the soft agar colonies and the nude mouse which we have seen. And the interesting thing is it again PKM2, PKM2 activity is down regulated again over here. So all the convergence on this tuner is happening. When you have so much of data you do computational aspects also. You try to see, okay, can I predict computationally if I look at this big information which is coming through all these approaches. And quickly, you can see in the ND3 background, this is the different levels of signals. Those who do bioinformatics may understand this quickly. And the genes which were implicated in tumors are implicated at early stages in this background. Similarly, in PKM2 background, the similar set of genes are involved at early levels. Can't go into the details, that's the unfortunate part. But then and then we have tried to understand this. I'll end up with this slide. So what is, why did I give you the story? I gave you the story that someone comes from a small place, lands up in All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, has no mentors, and then gets into a problem which is worldwide being pursued, Suc successfully passes through that phase. So there are lessons to be learned from this case study. So I have presented my case study in front of you telling you that through this case study there is a possibility that even if you have highs and lows and highs and lows of the kind where now I act as an equal partner in a study because infectious diseases were mentioned. So the, the, the papers on PLOS pathogen and cell and PLOS genetics are from our group not on this side the cell volume but the cell one over here which which we have contributed when we have tried to understand the infectious disease host pathogen relationships in the evolutionary context. 
And it, why is it that mycobacterium has been surviving for so long and they have been surviving along with the human when they came out of Africa? So probably they got infected. And what is it that created selection pressures of the kind where 95% of the people do not get infection, but it's only 5 to 10% who have the infection? Is there a background responsible for that? So asking such questions. Also asking that what happens to innate immune response and uh, acquired immune response genes. So that has given its own dividends in the kind, in understanding. So depth can be there. There can be issues people can ask in India and they say, I don't live these two lives. I don't live in these two worlds of impact factors, high and low. If it comes through very well. I also don't do premature declarations where people suffer later because they will say, we have found a molecule which is going to cure cancer. Even if we did this convergence study from all angles, from tumor tissues, we said that there's a tumor which was not accepted by Nature Genetics in 90s, only after 2005 Nature paper, I don't know whether the person reviewed it and then published Nature paper. But so all the story, now it has become important. We, we tried to say, I did not get DBT project at that time on this. They said, what is the relevance of pyruvate kinase? Why are you talking about it? There's no relevance. So my peer group also was not equipped that way to evaluate what will happen in future. Despite all this, you have, to, you have to keep the pace, you have to have faith in yourself, and you can do it. And so we have done it. And incidentally, for treatment purposes, now we mix microRNA, we do it with for these uh, phytochemicals, we do it with in combination with other drugs. It turns out that 200 to 500 fold less anti-cancer drugs have to be given in that particular background. So we are on that job to see that how we can take it to a level where probably cure is also possible, which I don't claim at the moment, but has to be confirmed. Are there simple innovative solutions? They are at hand and you simply have to implement them. Well, you have to look for them. Probably deep, clear understanding. Because all the mentors have given you all the rules. I, I concur with them. I agree with them because whatever guidelines have been mentioned by other mentors, I wanted to present it very differently through a case study of mine. And I've come into the conclusions of this kind that we, uh, we don't have to live our, in our subject domain. For me, the problem became that whenever I approach another PI that we can collaborate, they were, they were going away rather than coming nearer. So I had to learn in 40 years all kinds of things which I have tried to show you over here. And I began as a cytogeneticist. So I had to become molecular biologists, I had to become bioinformaticians, I, but I headed all these later so, because that was an advantage. I left many things undone. I feel so bad about them. I felt that they were very important to understand many things. And in the process of your movement forward, don't leave anything undone. I think the right time, if you choose those questions and address them, then they will not remain undone. This is another lesson. So I regret now when I look at this list and there will be many more that I feel, oh, I did not do this. This could have given me a lot of dividends in the story. So what is required is because we are always on a roller coaster. We are running. Administrator does not have, a science administrator does not have time. They're always running because they don't think, they don't, they don't stop and think. I think it has, it's required. You don't have to be on roller coaster all the time. You have to sit big. And we say in India, you have to do manan and chintan. And uh, probably that's also required. That's our traditional approach of meditating and then thinking. I think that keeps you cool. So that's another lesson which probably we should learn towards the end of the day to keep to be at peace with yourself. Because when you're at peace with yourself, you can think better. And they have been my collaborators and students who have contributed. I'm only the talking person. The rest contribution is their hard work, which these students have done. Thank you very much for patient listening.